Hey guys, this is Kala Juno Mojan Bing. Today I want to talk about dual wielding. Here I have two Niu Wei Dao from LK Chen. And they sent me two of them in part because they want me to talk about dual wielding. And these are just swords that I've been sent to review. I will be sending them back. First, I'm going to talk about the history of dual wielding. Then we're going to talk about some of the details of this specific, you know, LK Chen design. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the use of dual wielding and do a little comparison with the dual wielding that we see in historical European martial arts. Now, in lots of video games and movies, they love to have characters dual wielding, but the first thing you know need to know about dual wielding is that it's actually quite uncommon, historically speaking, and there's a few reasons for that. For one, it's uh, very difficult to do, to not, you know, hit yourself or to, you know, not have your swords hit each other, yeah, that kind of stuff. So, in addition to that, on the battlefield, there's not a really much of a point most of the time to have two swords because it's much better to have a sword and a shield because the shield can be much more defensive than your second sword can. So most of the time, whenever you see dual wielding, it's usually in a civilian context, but not always. And in China, we see a lot of interesting stuff. The dual wielding swords or Tao like this, I haven't seen any references to it before the Ming Dynasty, but it probably existed at some point. There might be some reference images or something I'm not aware of. Uh, but we do have dual wielding other weapons. For example, bar maces. Now, a bar mace is a really cool type of weapon. It's like a basically a crowbar with a sword handle, and it's useful for hitting the crap out of things. So. You can get two of those, and if you're wearing armor and you have two of them, you can really start wailing on, you know, people. So usually on the battlefield, you're going to see things like, you know, spears, pole arms, bows, crossbows, guns, and you almost never see dual wielding. It's very uncommon. However, there's a particularly notable example of dual wielding shuang dao, or dual sabers, and that is what's called the equal bei shuang dao. Now, during the Ming Dynasty, they had an anti-firearm kind of barrier that someone would hold it was called a quid bay basically it's a very thick quilt made of cotton at a distance musket balls are not able to go through it the person that's holding up the quid bay as a barrier for other comrades you know they themselves have their hands occupied holding up the blanket they're not able to effectively you know carry around a shield or a pole arm and whenever they do have to fight they need a weapon that will at least give them a fighting chance so they actually will carry uh, shuang dao or dual sabers. However, once again, this is something that is quite uncommon and almost all troops would never use this. If we can move to the civilian world, we can see that shuang dao becomes not necessarily commonplace, but more common than the battlefield. During the 19th century, the Qing dynasty was basically falling apart and it led to massive intake and violence within the empire itself. And that means that you know, civilians had to worry about self-defense and self-protection a lot more than they had previously in many ways. And this led to an increased prevalence in, you know, dual wielding. So in a civilian context, if you get in a duel, having two swords can be a massive advantage because they only have one, right? And you can block with one and strike with the other. Uh, however, it should be noted that it's not exactly like having these two Niu Wei Dao because these two Niu Wei Dao, for one, are full-sized, and a lot of the time, dual-wielded or dual sabers or dual dian even are much shorter than their, you know, single-handed counterparts. So additionally, you notice that the guard on this Dao is like a full oval shape. But if this was actually meant to be a pair, then it would actually be a semicircle, and the guard itself would be a semicircle, and these two blades would be able to meet together and fit into one sheath. If you actually had to carry around two different scabbards for two different swords to dual wield, it would just be a massive inconvenience. And I think that one reason why we do see dual wielding being done in civilian environments in China is a large part due to the fact that they had these, you know, scabbards which fit two blades inside them. And that design really allows shuang dao or shuang tian to be much more usable. Because no one in their regular life is going to be able to sit down in a chair if you have to have a scabbard sticking out of both your hips. I personally think that a pair of Dao would be an excellent weapon choice to carry around for civilian self-defense in, you know, a historical situation or maybe even an apocalyptic situation. <laughs> uh, down in the comments below, let me know what you think, what you would carry if you had to rely on, you know, melee weapons to survive in the world. So let's go on by looking at the form, function, build quality, all that stuff about the LK Chen Niu Wei Dao. 
So Niu Wei Dao means oxtail saber, and the reason it's called oxtail saber is because it's supposed to look like, you know, an oxtail. It flares out towards the end, has this, you know, swell that puts more mass towards the end of the blade, which is supposed to help you get a better cut. Now, one thing about Niu Wei Dao that many people sometimes misunderstand is that they actually don't need to be extremely heavy. A lot of the time they're actually quite thin in their distal taper. And what that means is it makes it a very good cleaving weapon. Now, Niu Wei Dao did not exist until the like mid to late 19th century in China. There are weapons that are like predecessors to the Niu Wei Dao, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. For now, we're just going to keep talking about this. Generally speaking, the Niu Wei Dao is a civilian weapon that's meant to fight against opponents who are not wearing armor, which explains why it's a civilian weapon. <laughs> it was never adopted by the Qing military, so it's not a military saber. It is just a, you know, Min Zhong saber. Now, if we look down at the handle, on Chinese Dao, there, broadly speaking, there are two categories of handle shape. The first one is called Fang Shi, the second one is called Yuan Shi. Fang Shi means square style, so it's like a rectangle, and Yuan Shi is rounded style, so it's kind of ovular. This one is, the, the actual grip is ovular, but if we look at the pommel, the pommel is not actually a ball, and many Yuan Shi Dao have a ball pommel. This one is actually a transition kind of between Yuan Shi and Fang Shi. And this is quite common on Niu Wei Dao. This grip is also, you know, fairly long. It gives you a little bit of counterbalance and you'll notice that it can actually curves opposite the blade. So this forward curving saber hilt became, started to become more popular around the mid Qing period. I also think that this is an adaptation which can work well in a civilian context because whenever you're, you know, dueling with a sword, you frequently want to keep it out and keep the point towards the opponent. And having this slight curved forward hilt allows you to do that more easily. Having a completely square hilt, you still can do it, but this just kind of aids in that. The blade on the LK Chen Niu Wei Dao is quite nice. It looks quite heavy from the profile, but because it has its pretty good distal taper, it actually is fairly light. It's The sword itself is a little under a kilogram, which is about a couple pounds, but in movement it feels pretty nice and feels like a proper sword. Aside from that, the length is about 30 inches, which is a very common length that many martial artists like to have nowadays. I personally like my dao to be just a little bit shorter, because I feel that uh, shorter dao or duan dao are quite underrated, <laughs> but that's just a personal preference, and this is a perfectly good length. The hilt on the Okay Chun Nyoi dao is actually pretty substantial. And because it has this lip and it's almost cup shaped, this actually reinforces the edge of the hu shou, or the guard, and makes it where it's much more resilient against blows beating down towards your hands. As far as build quality goes, I would say that the blade is very nice, the handle is nice, and the wrap feels very good and very tight, it hasn't loosened up at all when we use. Um, but I do think that the hu shou is a little bit rough. And you can, if you see, there's little like casting marks and stuff that are still left. Historically speaking, many of them were also rough because many Niu Wei Dao were not of the highest quality. There are quite a few that are very low quality. Uh, but I do think that it might look better if LK Chun uh, was cleaned up that casting or something a little bit. In addition to that, one of the Niu Wei Dao that I have here has a pommel that's a little bit loose. It just barely loosened up. And that's something that can happen, but of course it's preferable if it doesn't happen. And I cannot speak to the consistency of that happening. I just have two, and one of them loosened up a little bit. Now, no way of knowing how common that might be. I should say that this sword has been around to a few places, and differences in humidity can you know mess with the wood and the handle and potentially loosen the guard. And however, the fact that it is peen means that I am not able to personally you know tighten this back down. And that's something that I think everyone should know in my review. Also, the Niu Wei Dao both come with a scabbard. Now, this fitting of the scabbard are okay, but what I think is really interesting is the aperture opening that they have for the blade of the Dao. So if you look at the hole for the sword to go into scabbard, you notice that it's not just like a basic wedge or rectangular shape. It's because whenever you have a Niu Wei Dao, and you have such a wide end on the sword, you need to be able to slide that in first. And if you just kept the whole entire scabbard 
at the opening for the sword that wide, then you'd have a lot of extra space by the time you get to the, to the hilt. So they have almost two different holes that are overlaid into each other to fit this blade type. And if anyone watched my review of the Hanwei Nyoi Dao, you, this is something that I prefer to the scabbard design on that blade, which had a cut all along the back of it. Now let's talk a little bit about dual wielding techniques. So first thing I should say is that I'm not like an advanced practitioner of dual wielding. And what I've learned, I've learned from Jeremy Thomas at the Joplin Pakmei Athletic Association. And if anyone is interested in learning about that, you can check out his channel. And he also offers online courses, so you can check that out as well. Dual wielding techniques in Chinese martial arts usually involve these wide circular motions. And the idea behind that is that whenever I'm swinging in, I can, you know, attack with my front thaw or simply not knock aside their weapon and then come in with my other one. Your first strike can either be a direct attack or it can be like a beat or a deflection for your next blade. This is quite interesting if we take a look at Europe because in Europe dual wielding was very uncommon but it did exist for a short time in one-on-one -on -one duels and there's some techniques about it in Bolognese swordsmanship like Marazzo. One big difference between what you see with Chinese dual wielding and things like Marazzo are that uh, Marazzo for one is using two thrust centric blades and he's expecting to use them against another person with two thrust centric blades. What this means is that some of the motions are quite tight and the points are almost always forward and you're making these small little cuts. However in Chinese swordsmanship whenever you're using the Shuang Dao you're frequently employing very large cuts. You usually have you know one blade forward and one blade back what this allows you to do is make these large, powerful cuts, and if you keep them in a kind of a continuous motion, you can get a good flow going and come at all these different angles and be very rapid and powerful cuts at the same time. Uh, but it does leave you somewhat exposed to thrust, and I think that in some ways the Chinese dual wielding styles are quite suited to adapting to all manner of weapons as opposed to simply one-on-one -on -one duels. I actually don't think that it would have been super common for people with Shuang Dao in the past to face off against another person with Shuang Dao or Shuang Jian. I think that most of the time when you're in these type of, you know, civilian or militia skirmishing situations and you have Shuang Dao, you want to be able to adapt to all types of weapons and that could be like a spear even. So being able to use powerful cuts and deflections at the same time can be extremely useful. So as you can see, the Nui Dao from LK Chen cut very well, and as a pair they feel really cool, it's fun to swing two swords around, and yeah, I had a blast, you know, testing it out. Uh, thank you to LK Chen for sending me these for review, and if anyone else is interested, there's a link down in the description below where you can purchase them for yourself. Thank you all for watching, please subscribe and don't forget to stay sharp.